today we are going to talk about uh, uh, what is text analysis, basically trying to look at uh, different ways to analyze text. Just give you an outline. I'm going to start by uh, describing a little bit what do we mean by text and what is text analysis. Uh, it's relevance to social research. And I think the bulk of the talk will be about the, this different approaches to text analysis. How, and I'm going to show you an example of how you, actually, how you can actually do text analysis, how do you analyze text. And at the end of it, I'm just going to give a summary and a couple of take home messages. So, what do we mean by text? The term text refers to any instances of language. Language here, I mean words, sentences, in any medium, whether it's spoken or written, that makes sense to someone who knows the language. So, by example, you have written text such as uh, newspaper articles, uh, documents, and you have transcripts of spoken interviews and observations. So, in basically, in almost any kind of research, whether it's experiment or case study, you basically you involve looking at text in one way or another. When you analyze text, which approaches you use will depend on what is the focus of your research. Are you looking at text as an object, for example, to find out about why does text mean what it does to me and to anyone else? <coughs> or are you looking at text as an instrument for finding out about something else, for example, you want to find out about the system of some language, or the characteristic of the text itself, the purpose of the text, or what is actually in the text. So these two things are actually interrelated. So you, can't, you, you cannot explain why a text means what it does without understanding the whole system of, of language, and vice versa. You can't understand the whole system without understanding uh, what the text means and, and why. So what is the relevance of uh, text analysis to social research? Then why why do you need you, why do you need to look at text analysis? Because in social research, you're often confronted with all these language materials. You, you get a lot of documents and you do a lot of interviews. So in a sense, you basically, by doing text analysis, you're focusing on this detailed analysis of language, uh, detailed analysis of text. <coughs> but by that, I, did, I didn't mean that you reduce everything to kind of, everything to all the social analysis, reduce the language, it's not. It's just that one, it's just text analysis, focus on language is just one analytical strategy of doing social research. So you need to combine it with other forms of analysis, such as ethnography, which is what we do a lot in uh, our head, what we do, we combine uh, interviews, observations, and we also do text analysis. So it's basically trying to use this micro-linguistic analysis to address social issues. I'm going to show you next uh, all these the different approaches to text analysis, which is, again, dependent on the focus of research. I'm going to look at four different focuses here. So the first one, is uh, if you're interested in looking at these rules and principles, one of the approaches that you can use is this called pragmatics. The name they're often associated with it is Austin and Cyril. It's about understanding meaning making. It's about looking at how the transmission of meaning does not only depend on your linguistic knowledge, for example, your grammar or your vocabulary, but it's also dependent on the context, the context of the utterance, for example, your pre-existing knowledge, in the manner of you speak, the time, the place where you speak, so it all kind of contributes to it. Uh, one example of uh, doing pragmatics is by this speech act, speech act theory by Austin. It's speech act is basically, speech act defined as an utterance that serves a function. So for example, when, you, uh, when you're saying sorry, apology, or when you compliment someone, when you're inviting someone, that's all, uh, that's, that's you being seen as you're doing a speech act. Another example is this politeness, politeness theory by Brown and Levinson. It's about how politeness is about how you deal with this concept of face and how you actually deal with uh, an act that basically, which, are, which can be potentially damaging to your face. So for example, uh, when you are in an embarrassing interaction, you, you laugh. Well, that's kind of an example of when you're trying to do politeness. Uh, another approach is this, uh, what is called conversation analysis. Names that are often associated with this is uh, Emmanuel Shegloff and Harvey Sachs. It's about analyzing everyday conversation. It's often associated with this, uh, if you're familiar with Garfinkel ethnomethodology or Goffman concept of interaction order. Uh, I'm going to show you an example of how to do this conversation analysis in the next slides, because I think that's kind of quite relevant, I think it's more relevant. Uh, this a study by Hewitt looking at this doctor-patient interaction. Right. So 
in this example, is uh, Qubit was actually comparing this face-to-face uh, -face and telephone consultations in primary care. So a lot of previous studies in looking at telephone consultation has shown that telephone consultation is a way of promoting freeing up GP time, reduce ALE time. Some studies have shown that it's not. But then the, a lot of these previous studies actually focusing on looking at the attitudes of and the impact of this telephone conversation. And Hewitt is actually the first who've done this kind of the first comparative analysis of communicative practices in general practice. By communicative practice, I mean things like you know, what is actually happening in this, during this consultation. So in this here, okay. the first two uh, line of exchanges here is, this is basically the, the GP was returning a call from a patient. So in the first line, the patient answered call and then said hello. And then the GP introduced himself by saying, hello, this is Dr. McIntyre from the health center. I got a message for phone. So he's implying that in, in conversation analysis, you do this kind of study about turn taking. So at this line to here, when the GP was saying he's using himself as a GP, and he was saying, I got a message to phone, he's expecting the patient then to, as part of this, his turn, to return and say what his problem is. But as you can see here, in line three, the patient say, oh, right, yes, who, who's this? So the patient didn't actually understand that his call is being returned. So in line four, the GP again, then repeat his self-identification as GP by saying the name of the patient is about Leslie Kirkness. And in, in line five here, the patient acknowledged that this is, this is the name person but then there's this, uh, the bracket and the one in conversation analysis is this one second pause, which is considered a long pause. So then it's just, this is kind of show that there's a breakdown in communication. Again, he didn't, he didn't again disclose about his problem. It's like, oh, there's a pause. And in line seven, the doctor re re again repeat again his self-identification as a GP. And only in line eight, then the patient realized, oh, yes, this is what I'm supposed to say. <coughs> I'm supposed to tell problem is. <clears throat> and then this, in line nine, this, uh, in terms of conversation analysis, this, the dot just minutes, just barely notice of a pause. So it's like, in, 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 when you're doing conversation analysis, you need to do kind of, even you need to count how many seconds is the pause in that, so you need to use this question software to kind of do transcription. <clears throat> and uh, in the following exchanges, line from line 10 to 14 here, you can see that the GP <clears throat> keeps saying, uh-huh, patient was saying what, uh, describing what, uh, more about his problem. In line 12, the GP said, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is basically <clears throat> a type of acknowledgement token, which he's kind of indicating to the patient, yes, I'm listening, and I want to, I want to hear more. So that's why the patient then <clears throat> keep elaborating what his problem is. <clears throat> In line 15 here, the patient then say, but it's, it, it is really swollen and pretty painful, but emphasize, he's emphasizing again what his problem is. He's basically saying that, yes, I've finished what I, was, I wanted to say. So then what, what does Hewitt found in, in her study? Oh, sorry. So Hewitt found that uh, telephone consultation is actually appropriate medium for single non-complex concern. But it's not for discussing new acute problems because it's almost a, whenever in telephone consultation a patient is saying something or GP identify acute problem, it was referred the patient to a face-to-face -face consultation. And uh, GPs do not actually change their communicative behavior on the phone. But what is interesting is that this period of silences is actually quite important because it provides this space for the GP or the patient to kind of disclose any any new topic or if there's any new problems that they want to ask. So again, then this kind of silences and stuff is the kind of things that you can only get by doing conversation analysis. So you can see it's quite laborious, really. It's time, it requires time and effort, and you need to do transcription and all that. Transcribing is part of the analysis. Uh, next one. So if you're interested, if the focus of your research is looking at the 
context. One approach is that you can use is this ethnography of communication. <coughs> uh, names are associated with this is Del Himes. It's about combining linguistic <coughs> and ethnography. It's basically about anthropologists and uh, interested in how people in society vary in the way they speak. So the example of this is this study by Philipson in 75, which is quite dated, but yeah. It's about, that, uh, Philipson found about how these uh, blue collar men living near Chicago, they actually speak or they actually don't speak to you, depending on the context of communication or depending on your personal identity relationship. For example, you're not the same gender, you're not the same, sa uh, sorry, yeah. you're not the same gender, you're not the same age. So they just, they don't use this natural talk if you're not part of the same kind of group. <clears throat> so uh, ethnography of communication is basically about studying about intercultural communication. Another approach that you can use is this interactional social linguistic uh, by John Gumpers. It's about studying how language users actually create meaning via social interaction. So he showed how different people, <coughs> you may share the same grammatical knowledge, but then if you say it in different contexts, it has a different meaning. So an application of this is, uh, one example is this Tannen did a lot of study on this, the difference between the, the way women and men talk. So she came up with this uh, different speech styles. What she found is that uh, men and women, they, she come up with this uh, terms a uh, rapport or report talk. So while uh, women use language for intimacy, it's about trying to get closeness, it's like the talk is the glue that holds the relationship together, and getting consensus and all that. Women just thought men would just talk as an information to get to maintain the upper hand in the conversation. Uh, she's also kind of, it's another interesting thing, she came up with this conversational rituals, which is uh, the use of the I and the we. It's like when you're trying to describe your achievement, women use a lot of, well, we did this as a team, whereas men often use I did this. So it's like by, by trying to sound less arrogant, women don't actually get the kind of recognition that they deserve. That's what she found. Uh, another example is this, which I'm going to show you next on how to do it, is the about women leadership discourse in the workplace. This is an interesting example here. This is a, interest, a study that Holmes did. Uh, it's about uh, humor and gender in the workplace. A lot of studies of, of women managers has found that women actually, there's quite a lot of negative stereotypes about women managers. They're not good at giving directive, they're not good at running meeting, and they lack a sense of humor. There are quite a lot of studies that's done on humor before. It's like humor is actually considered quite important because it serves a different function in the workplace. It can, uh, I know it entertains and stuff, but they also find that by using humor, you actually construct this relationship with, the co with your colleagues. But then there's quite, uh, there's lack of studies actually that looking at specifically relating gender with humor. So what Holmes did is that she collected this large corpus of workplace interaction in New Zealand. And as she's got there, she, she got volunteers to do, to tape record everyday interaction. So she's got this, their volunteers to carry the tape recorder wherever they go. Some of them would just leave it at a desk. And she also did a video recording of uh, meeting interaction. I think before I go to the example, I should explain a little bit about these things that you see this equal marks and the slash and stuff. In line, so for example, in line five and in line seven, you see that equal marks, they're called latching between utterances, which means that there's it's a continuous, continuous uh, utterance. Whereas that slash means that there's a simultaneous utterance, so it's basically like an interruption. So in this study, this is about uh, this is about uh, gendered humor around sex, which is off, which is co commonly used in a mixed gender meeting. The context of this is that there's an exchanges at the end of the meeting between two men and two women about a performance scheme. And then, and this is interesting because in line seven here, okay, Celine is basically the chair of the meeting and she's also the most senior person in the room. <coughs> she's making a reference to exposing her underwear, which is like, it's quite, Holmes find it is quite uh, uncommon, but because this, the gender <coughs> here, 
humor. It's actually initiated by a, by a woman rather than a man. And then, um, you might actually also see it as what there might be an element of sexual harassment here, isn't it, referring to someone's underwear. But anyway, but then when she said that, and then she's, and then her and Wendy, in line t 10 to 12 here, these two women, started to elaborate the problem further. The problem of you having to bend down to the short skirt. And then Wendy then keep, <coughs> Wendy even elaborate even further about the description of the problem, at which point then, uh, one of the men finally responded in line uh, 15 here, John, he finally responded to that. Obviously, he plays the part that he's been set up for. So John was like, oh, you're gonna... And then the next couple of things, like they're, they're basically responding to, responding to the humor. Uh, but it's also interesting here, that in line 17 here, John was talking about all pleasures being taken away. But rather than talking about his own pleasure, he's talking about Don's ple pleasure. So he's talking about someone else's pleasure. So at this, then, uh, in, only in line 19 and 20, then Don kind of respond, oh, we haven't noticed, never. And then this kind of, uh, uh, Holmes called this, is, uh, this kind of contributions is a contestive humor. So it's delivered and like challenging the claims that the woman has made. And it's kind of, it's, it's delivered in kind of competitive discourse style. So it's firstly, it's overlapping with Wendy. And then at the end of it, Don is kind of quite quippy, one at a time, if you can like to comment, which is good. Holmes found it's kind of quite, you often see this coming out from men, actually, rather than women. So what, what Holmes found is that both men and women actually use humor that constructed and reinforced these negative gender stereotypes. Women as sexual objects and uh, men as this titillated audience. <laughs> but, but women actually prepared to challenge and contest the humor, which is dependent on gender stereotypes dis that disadvantage women. So you can see the way uh, interaction of social linguistic analysis here, which is kind of quite similar to conversational analysis. But it's, again, it's laborious and it's, you know, it takes time and effort to do that. But then again, you get all this thing that you don't get by just analyzing its content. I'm gonna pause a few seconds there to see if there's any questions. No questions? Just move on. The next one is, uh, oh, what is this called? It's not the right slides, is it? Yeah. yeah, I tried it high. Sorry, a few seconds. Something wrong with the computer. Uh, the next approach to text uh, analysis is uh, if you're interested in looking at the function and structure of the text, one way of doing it is by using what is called systemic functional linguistics by Halliday. This is basically a functional approach to language. It means it's looking, at, uh, it's looking at the grammar of it, looking at the grammar in terms of its functional terms. Uh, it's basically looking at the text and you see why do you use a particular grammar rather than the others. For example, you want to get someone to open the book. You can say, open the book. You can say, you could open the book. Or you can say, you should open the book. Why do you use could and should? So that's kind of thing that uh, systemic functional linguistics will try to kind of unravel. I'm going to show you an example how to do this later on. I'm also going to show you how to do this uh, genre analysis, which is <clears throat> unlike systemic functional linguistics that are looking at the grammar, the genre analysis we're looking at these communicative purposes, so looking at the structure of the text. In 
terms of uh, system of functional linguistics, I'm going to show you uh, there are different ways of analyzing grammar using uh, this SFL approach. But I'm going to show you modality because I think it's a good <coughs> introductory place to start. Uh, it's like it's, it's going to take years to understand everything about SFL, and it's just it's the reading, looking at the books will give you nightmares. So I think this modality is kind of a good place to start. So what do I mean by modality? What is modality? According to Halliday, modality refers to speaker's judgment of the probability or obligation in what he or she is saying. So it's something in between the positive, negative, this those areas meaning between a yes and a no. So like for the example that I gave earlier, why you use why should you use cook and shoot and why can't you just say open the book? <clears throat> and uh, there are different variables in modality. You can look at modality in terms of its type, which means that you're looking at this, there's two types of modality. You're looking at epistemic modality, which is uh, about information and knowledge exchange. For example, when you said something is this, for, exa for example, that's kind of kind of statement to truth, truth statement. Or you can look at deontic modality, modality, which is basically talking about what ought to be. Or you can look at or you, another variable of modality is you look at it in terms of orientation, whether it's subjective, for example, if you say I or she, explicit or implicit, or she will, she should, or you're looking at objective, uh, explicit or implicit, for example, like it's likely that, or she probably, or she usually. And there are also different levels of commitment in modality. Whether you're interested in high level of modality, for example, we use things like, or oh, this is certain this, or this is always this, that's a high level. And there's a median level, for example, probably or usually, or low level of modality, possibly, sometimes, allowed. I'm going to show you an example of this. Uh, this is a, uh, a paper that we did uh, from our study. When we were looking at this uh, during one of the change where this practice-based commissioning, where GP is given a commissioning responsibility. Basically, this GP is now uh, has a managerial role. So I was, in this paper, I was interested in looking at, so you basically have two hats, you're a GP and your manager. So at what point did the GP identify himself as a GP, and what point did the GP identify himself as a manager? So in this uh, first two extract here, In this first two extract here, uh, the first GP, if you, if the first GP was saying that, oh, for me, I think my major role is to ensure that the PCT is aware of different needs of practices. So my job is value for money. And the second GP was saying that, oh, it's really supposed, it's mainly as a clinical input to consort your manager. So in a sense, if you're looking at the content of it, you can see that the, the two GPs has a different understanding of what their role is. But if you're looking at the modality that they use, for example, the first GP, when they describe the role, the GP used this term like, I think this, and the second GP was saying, I suppose it seems. So by having this kind of two kind of different subjective modality, she's actually weakening her statement. So if you're looking at, in terms of modality, the second GP actually has a lower level of understanding of what her role is than the first GP. And the reason for that is because, obviously, she's, she's She's newer than the, the first GP, only recently took, a, took the role as a GP manager, so she's still un very unsure and uncertain about her role. Whereas in the, in the next uh, two, is like, uh, when we ask them about their role as a GP, they're kind of very confident, saying, like, I am first and foremost a GP. So at the moment, I am a GP, rather than saying, I think I'm a GP, say, I am a GP. So they had, they're more certain about their identity as a GP than as a manager. Uh, modality also able to kind of let you kind of identify this thing like you can see the way they use or they see the, I think the PCTC the structure as that you know they see the consortia as important because it's us the PDC so it's looking at the, them and us you know those use of pronouns so when you analyze it kind of SFL you're looking at all this uh, uh, grammatical you're looking at the grammar I'm going to show you here, when you do genre analysis, you're looking at the function of the text in terms of this, the function of a 
yeah, the function of it in terms of the overall function of the tax. So well, the previously I showed you an example of how you analyze interview data using system functional linguistic. Here I'm going to looking at how you look at uh, documents. How do you analyze documents using job analysis? So this is a this is an example for when I did my PhD. So I was I was interested in looking at. Uh, uh, you hear claim that the media sensationalized news story. So they always exaggerate whatever they reported in the news story. News story. And um, I was trying to kind of understand where and how the sensationalization occurs. So I was trying to get access to to the newspaper, and I was oh I've been told that don't bother, you're never going to get access to the media and all that kind of thing. That's another you know access problem. You never no chance they're going to let you sit in with them to see what they're doing. But anyway, I managed to get access to the Guardian and the Herald in Scotland. So I managed to shadow a journalist for a health journalist and health editor for a, a week. So I was sitting with her and I was sort of trying to kind of look at how do they actually produce this news story? How do they decide what, which, because they get a lot of press release and stuff. And they, how do they decide which story to publish? And how did that then actually get published? How, how is it actually written? And how did it actually get published in the papers? So <clears throat> when I was sitting with the health editor, I was like looking, but a lot of things that they write is actually quite, almost, it's, it's not even a paraphrase, it's almost a copy and paste from a press release. So I was like, oh, that's weird. I, would, I was expecting them to kind of paraphrase bits and pieces, but it's not, it's just a <laughs> put it over there. So I thought, okay, let's, let's look at the text itself. Let's, let's try to analyze it in detail to see whether there's actually really a difference in that. So I collected all the press release with its associated uh, newspaper reports and did a journal analysis of it. So for example, uh, how you do this is one way of doing journal analysis. So basically you, you see that this thing, you have a headline, donor blood breakthrough claim. So in headline, you always see a lot of this kind of sensa the sensationalizing terms here, breakthrough, everything is a breakthrough. Because the headline is because the function of a headline is actually to attract readers to read the article more. So you need to kind of say something that's very interesting in that short space, really. So in abstract of an abstract, if you look at next, the, the lead, the lead, is, uh, the lead uh, paragraph that says, scientists have developed a simple method of converting blood from one group to another. Again, a breakthrough that could lead to an end to blood shortages in Scotland. Again, you also have this term breakthrough. So again, this is basically where the sensationalization happens at this, at this uh, the headline and the lead. The, 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 the reason because they use this kind of term of breakthrough, again, like I mentioned earlier, because to try to get the readers to read the article further. <clears throat> and then you have things like uh, possible consequences of that, and a commentary, and uh, you have the back, you only have the background of the story later on, and you have this follow-up reaction, which is kind of quite common in the newspaper because they try to provide a balanced report, and so you need to have positive, and then you need to have somebody negative saying it at the other end. So that's their definition of balance. And then um, only, only towards the end, and usually they attribute the article to the journal where who published the story. And then you have another commentary from the journal as well. So when I did this and I was, I come up with this, uh, I, use, I, I was using Swale's genre analysis method, which is what Swale's did was they're trying to identify this move structure. The idea of move is uh, from the concept of schema in psychology. So it's basically your cognitive structure. It's like a, it's like a, the organization of knowledge in your memory, which is based on again your past experience, you know, text that you read before. So what I found is like when I compare the move structure with the, uh, from press release with news report, you can see that quite, is they're quite similar. The difference is this thing that I highlighted in red. You have this thing, for example, in press release, where you have this move about establishing credentials. It's basically, it, it is the credentials of the organization who issued a press release, whereas you don't have that in the newspaper report. You have this thing, uh, which is quite similar in the news report, is this attribution, basically attribution to the journalists who write the article. And uh, another one, that in press release, you have this promoting the research, which is basically positive evaluation about the research, what is so good about the research, because they're trying to, obviously trying to get the newspaper to write the story, so they need to write all this positive stuff about the research. And they never, they never actually presented the negative side of it. Whereas in the newspaper report, you have this, because it's about balanced reporting, so the, 
newspaper will always try to give you what is the positive and negative evaluation of the research itself. <clears throat> and uh, another is the, all this indicating the source of information in a uh, newspaper report is basically uh, is about uh, saying where the scientist is from or which journal has been published. So again, when I was looking at it, then you can see that the difference is only those small little things, but the, the bulk of it is actually is actually quite the same. So this woman. So when you hear when you hear when, when I did this, I did the interview with scientists and stuff. Most of this claim of distortion come from the scientists who published the article. But if you look at it, the scientists actually do help. Like for example, the press release office read the article. So in a sense, scientists actually contribute to the to the distortion itself and this sensationalism. And again, this I think I think it's a kind of it's an example again that you cannot only analyze text. You need to kind of combine it with different method of data collection or analysis. So because in this case, I did the interview, I did the observation, I did shadowing, then I analyzed the text as well. So you get a richer picture about what's happening. Yeah. Uh, one of the last. Uh, approach that I'm talk, talking about here is when you're interested in looking at uh, power and politics. I think this is mostly associated with a critical discourse analysis approach. I'm not going to go through this, I'm just leaving it there if you're interested in looking at critical discourse analysis. Uh, because I think there's quite a lot of misconception when, when you refer to CDA, it's, 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 uh, people say it as a method. CDA is not a method, it's a methodology. So it's not, they're not telling you how to do analysis. They're using a different, they're using, each, each of these different approaches use a linguistic analysis. So they are a methodology, they're not a method. And the way they use linguistic analysis, it depends on whether they're gonna focus, it, they use it to a different extent, and they use it with different focus and different intensity. For example, which I'm gonna show later on, is this Fairclough using CD, uh, his Fairclough CDA is basically using this holiday systemic functional linguistic approach to do this linguistic analysis. Uh, some of the examples of uh, using CDA is this, uh, Fair Club did a study about new labor and new language. It's basically, he found that how, um, he analyzed Tony Blair's rhetoric, and he found that reveal how the language of uh, new labor with its uh, third wave rhetoric on its core actually able to background its, uh, its, its actual neoliberal political commitment. Or he's also doing this interesting study about marketization of public discourse, where he analyzed university prospectus and saying the product that university actually become more marketized. We look at this discourse of commodification or discourse of globalization. Uh, this is also another uh, interesting study by uh, Wardak looking at the role of women uh, member of European Parliament. So what Wardak did is trying to find how this how this woman MEP in high position of power how they actually present themselves to be guaranteed that they're taken seriously in all this very male-dominated environment. Or you can look at uh, Van Dyke did a quite interesting study as well about the discourse and racism in the news media. I'm just gonna show you uh, quickly about how Fairclough actually did his CDA using Halliday's uh, modality. So you can see here in the first extract is uh, taken from Tony Blair's speech at the Labour Party conference. He's saying he used a lot of this kind of he oscillates between I and the we. So it's like speaking on behalf of a personal statement, but also speaking on behalf of a community. So he's saying things like I realize this is about globalization. He said I realize why people protest against globalization because we watch an aspect of it. We feel this. So it's kind of it's kind of oscillates, it's changing between speaking I statement and this is we statement. And it's also quite dialogical because he says well, the issue is not how to stop globalization, the issue is how we use the power of community. So it's kind of, it's quite, it's quite, it's like a dialogue, isn't it? And he also talked authoritatively because he said, but globalization is a fact. It's like those who I mentioned earlier about epistemic modality. This is this, so he's saying this is a fact. In the second extract, you can see that he's, 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 he kind of changed the way he speaks. Because this is this is an uh, extract from a television, a television TV interview with David Frost. So he in, in this extract, he used a lot of this uh, 
pronoun. It's like uh, we have this our yeah. our taxes and our lifestyle, you know, so quite inclusive. It's like all the rest of it. There's a big question about Britain's future, and he's using kind of what what is called a mental verb. So I believe this. I believe that. So the, the two abstract here it shows that he's actually is quite clever really because he's got this he's presented a mixed identity. He, he presents himself as Blair as the politician who can speak authoritatively, but he's also like a normal person. He's like he feels something, he believes in something, so he's like a normal. So he's he's gonna swap his identities. So the swap it depend on the context and also depend on the audiences. Next, I'm gonna pass it on to John. He's going to show you that you can actually focus on this power and politics and looking at the language and policy documents. Thanks, Mona. Um, I just really wanted to, to just kind of talk through my, some aspects of my PhD and, and one particular part of it, which is the, the use of language in policy documents and then how that can kind of be linked to empirical work within an organisation. So um, just, just briefly, my PhD was focused on the Health and Social Care Act 2012 and the introduction of clinical commissioning groups, or CCGs. And essentially, these new organizations took on responsibility for planning and purchasing healthcare services for particular populations. And they're mostly kind of made up of, of GPs. And they replaced primary care trusts, um, which were abolished in, in the same act. Um, I've talked uh, at more length, in more length about um, my work in a previous water session on policy document analysis. So I, what I, I just want to focus in on the kind of language angle here and, and just talk at a, at a kind of more superficial level. But the, the policy document analysis element of my work was, um, it involved kind of looking at three different documents. So there was the Equity and Excellence White Paper, the Health and Social Care Act itself, and, and then another document called Towards Establishment, which was uh, created by um, what's now known as NHS England. So this is a kind of arm's length governmental body that was introduced within the Act as well. Um, so really what I did was just to kind of to, to look at these documents and try and understand how the problem that the policy was supposed to solve was framed and then what that solution was. So I was kind of looking critically at the message that, that, that the, the documents were kind of giving out. But in terms of the language, one of the really key components of this problem solution was the idea that clinical commissioning groups were going to be membership organisations. And this was something which was kind of talked about in a really positive way. It was treated as this kind of axiomatically positive characteristic of these organisations. But it wasn't really unpacked or ex explored in that much detail. Um, so I've got an extract here from the Towards Establishment document, which I've just mentioned. So what I'll do is just, is just read through this and then pull out parts of the use of language that I think are particularly significant. So CCGs will be different from any predecessor NHS organisation. While statutory NHS bodies, they'll be built on the GP practices that together make up the membership of a CCG. So it's the status as membership organisations that makes them different. And they're going to be built, physically built from the GP practices that make up the membership. I mean, it's important to note that it's the GP practices, as in the organisations, that are framed as the, the members in this context rather than individual GPs. Um, and the second bit, these member practices must decide through developing their constitution and within the framework of legislation how the CCG will operate. So practices have to decide within certain parameters defined by government. Uh, essentially how their CCG will be run and how they'll be governed. And that's leaving aside the issue of you know, how organisations themselves come to present a particular decision and whose kind of opinions and preferences that might kind of privilege. Finally, they must ensure that uh, they're led and governed in an open and transparent way, which allows them to serve their patients and populations effectively. So practices have this kind of duty to engage with their CCG, to become involved, to be active members. Uh, to shape its operation and ensure that it kind of uh, demonstrates principles of kind of good governance, so transparency and things like that. Not only that, but a failure to, to do that um, could have a negative impact on, on the care that patients receive. So this is really crucial because the language is binding the idea of being a good member 
but actually being a good doctor. So I, I, th I think this, this extract is useful because it's kind of indicative of the broader framing of the membership organization idea within these policy documents. This idea that it's, it's going to be about kind of control and responsibility, um, being a bottom-up organization that kind of demonstrates these, these principles of good governance and transparency. So what I was interested to do from, from kind of engaging with documents, looking at the language in this way, I, I then kind of went into the fieldwork context with the CCG, with the case study CCG. And I wanted to explore what this concept, this idea of being a membership organisation meant to them. And I was really struck actually by the parallels between how the concept was presented in the policy with how it was uh, kind of thought of and portrayed by people in the governing body of the CCG. So the governing body is essentially um, responsible for, for most of the kind of the running functions of the organization. There's a lot of elected GP members, other senior managers and people like that. But they, they, they really talked about the identity of the organization in a way that was really wrapped up with some of these kind of characteristics around being a good membership organization. Um, not only that, but they, they seem to think that the and again, this kind of parallels the line in the policy that, that being a membership organisation in this way represented a kind of cultural shift away from the primary care trust and this kind of top-down approach to, to getting things done in the health service. And they tended to see that their prospects of success as an organisation were really contingent on the extent that they could get their members to really buy into the idea of being a membership organisation. So there, there was a lot of talk about kind of how can we win the hearts and minds of our members? And there was some dissatisfaction expressed by some people within the governing body um, when they felt that there'd been kind of missed opportunities to do that, to really get people to see what it was all about and to get on board with it. So, in, in conclusion, what I've just kind of tried to show you here in, in a very brief way is, is this membership organization idea and the language used to communicate it um, in, in the policy can be seen in one sense as kind of an attempt to engineer some consent from the people that are really involved in it, so it's primarily GPs in this case. Um, but then it, it, kind of taking, taking that, uh, that kind of understanding from the, the documents into the, the organisational setting sort of allowed me to see that there was a, a subsection of GPs which essentially took on responsibility for kind of trying to, to uh, promulgate this kind of idea of, of a membership organisation and, and to disseminate these ideas. And actually that's partly because their positions of authority within the organisation were really quite dependent on other people buying into the idea itself. So, so hopefully this has kind of illustrated how sort of critically examining language in, in policy documents can um, provide a framework to start to explore kind of ideas and actions at a local organisational level. So I'll hand back to Melvin now. Thank you, John. I'm just going to summarise what we have talked about today. So basically, uh, why do you need to do tax analysis? Why tax analysis is important? Because it's actually, because when you're doing social research, you're confronted with this language material. So you're basically looking at language. And it's important because it, it allows you, by doing tax analysis, it allows you to look at this fine green interrogation of this language material. It's like a microscope for language material, but you also need to look at it in the context. But then I should emphasize that doing text analysis is just one analytical strategy you need to combine it with other forms of analysis. And which approaches you adopt will depend on what is the focus of your research. Uh, yes, I think that's us, isn't it? I've got a couple of references here, which I think will be online. I don't think you can read it here, but it'll be online. And uh, what, our, what is our next, what is sessions, which is Donna Brahma is going to talk about what is situational analysis.